Okay, so this is the second time I recorded this because OBS decided to only record half of each segment that I made. So let's hope this one goes well. Okay, so in kind of this tutorial, we're going to kind of shift the focus on what we've been doing for designer materials and we're going to figure out and learn how we can take all of those maps that we've made in designer and basically render them out to make some nice beauty shots like you can see on artstation and well really artstation i don't know where anyone else puts their stuff online to be honest so i'm using marmoset toolbag 3.06 for this and anything that i'm showing you today should be relatively applicable on pretty much most kind of current versions of Marmoset Toolbag. I know I'm a version or two behind and even a couple versions earlier than 3.06 should be able to do all of this uh, just as well. If not, I mean, you'll probably yell at me in the comments anyway. So yeah, you can do that too. And so we're going to want to import our model or our mesh to be able to render our maps onto. And so I've actually got a sphere mesh that I'm going to give you guys for free on my Patreon. If you take a look in the uh, link below, you can get it for free so you can follow along. And if you do that, all you're going to get is this guy right here. And so this guy has been UV unwrapped to be able to fit our uh, material across just like it does in Substance Designer. So I'm not going to show you in this tutorial how to actually unwrap it, but instead I'll just give you away my own for free. So now that we've got uh, this guy in here, I want to just kind of explain what's going on in the viewport here. So up in the top left we've got uh, our Explorer tab here, or whatever it's called in Marmoset, but uh, equivalent to the Explorer tab in Substance Designer. We've got our properties tab down here where we have all the properties for everything that we uh, select. In the middle, we've got our 3D viewport and the way to navigate is by alt and left click to orbit, alt and middle mouse button to pan and shift and right click to rotate your HDRI. And then of course, zooming in and out is the scroll wheel. Down below, we've got our timeline for if we do any animations, which I think we'll be doing at the end of this tutorial, or at least showing you how to set that up. In the top right, we've got our materials section. And right now you can see that we've got our default material. And if I click on that guy, we've got all of the parameters for our uh, material down below here. So now that we've set all that up, I want to go ahead and I'm just going to create a new material. And I'm going to call this one snow. And I'm just going to drag that guy in on top and nothing's going to change because they're basically the same base material. But we're going to be able to play around with these parameters for our snow material here. And you can see the first one that we're getting right now is the surface. And you can see that normal map is checked off. It is our normals. So I'm going to click on this little box here. Navigate to where I've got my textures. And I'm going to select our normal map. And so a word of caution, um, Marmoset uses the OpenGL normal format for their normal maps. So if you're bringing in a direct X, which I believe is the default in Substance Designer, all you'll have to do is come into this guy here and you're gonna want to flip the Y channel. And it's gonna look a little weird on my normal map because mine is OpenGL already. But if you bring in a direct X, you just wanna make sure you flip the Y. Otherwise, if it's OpenGL, you're good to go. So the next one is our microsurface information. And I think by default, this might be set to glossiness, but I like to use a roughness map. So if we, if you have the option, you can just go there and select roughness map. And then we click this guy and go roughness. However, if 
you are stuck to glossiness here, all you have to do is still input your roughness map and then you can just click on invert and it's going to do the exact same thing as your roughness map would. I'm just going to leave mine on roughness and then you can see that we can play around with the overall roughness of this uh, material using our roughness map. The next one is our albedo. And so I'm going to select my base color. And then I'm going to skip over diffusion for now. We're going to cover that kind of after we've uh, done all the lighting and everything for our material. And it's going to make a lot more sense once we have. So I'm skipping over to reflectivity. And so by default, this might be set to specular for you. But because we're using the metalness roughness workflow, at least I am, I want to set this to metalness. And we can either just hit invert or we can slide this metalness slider all the way down because none of this is actually metal. And by default, it's going to just select everything as being metal because we have not a mask to denote any areas of metalness because there's nothing metal. So I'm just going to bring that all the way down. And then lastly, I want to come down to occlusion. And you can see it's kind of grayed out. We can't select it because we have to click on this little arrow and hit occlusion. And that's going to open the drop down. And so we're going to be able to use this for our uh, aiming occlusion map. And if I click on that guy there and come up to aiming occlusion, you can see immediately what it's going to do is just place our ambient occlusion over top here. And it's a little bit harsh for what it is. So I kind of drop that down by half just so you get a little bit more of the, uh, the shadow information so that it's actually visible. But it really doesn't have as much influence as it does before because it looks kind of stylized if we leave it at one. It's also not really physically accurate as well. And so I also want to come down here to our cavity map. And I just plug this guy in as well, just to give a little bit of added uh, information. And so the diffuse and the cavity are basically just uh, how much this has on the diffuse light, our ambient occlusion, and how much this has on the specular reflections of our material. And so it's going to be a little hard to demonstrate uh, more so the, the specular reflections, but if I come back up to the roughness and I bring this all the way down, you can see that as I increase and decrease the specular uh, cavity, in the areas where our ambient occlusion is actually affecting mostly, you can see that it's dimming the reflections or not having any influence over them. So I like to have this kind of around 0.25, just so that it has a little bit of an effect, but not too much. I also want to, if I bring up the roughness again, I want to uh, alter the diffuse because you can see we're having the same issue where it looks really harsh and it kind of just looks stylized at this point. And so if I just come into our diffuse cavity here and I bring this guy way down, I just want to bring this to around do 0.1. Again, just so it's affecting a little bit, but nothing too crazy there. So that's starting to look pretty good. So to start off, we basically finished our material here and all of the parameters that we have down here, except we're missing kind of one key component to add really arguably kind of the, the more important features of this material being the height information. And you can see that we don't really have any areas to put it because we need to come back up to the top and you can see that we have our sub, uh, subdivision sorry, and our displacement. So I want to do our uh, PN triangles for our subdivision. And then our displacement, I'm going to set that to height. And this is going to allow us to input our displacement or height. Same, you know, two different words for the same thing, really. Um, our displacement or height map. So I'm going to input that guy there. And I'm going to input that. And you can see immediately that's going to pretty much destroy our mesh here. Just crunch it because we have such a contrasted um, height map. So if I bring that scale way down, 
you can see now that we're starting to get some height information. And if I just click on our mesh here, you can see that the tessellations have allowed us to have such a nice, uh, robust, and um, high density mesh. And if I decrease that tessellation, you can see that it's still not too bad, really, except we get some areas of point like that, where if we increase the tessellation, now we've got this super dense mesh. And also, if I kind of orbit around, it kind of starts to chug just a little bit. So say you've got your material and your setup kind of kind of how you like it and you don't really want to go around and start playing with all these features to kind of make it more uh, viable to orbit around your mesh and you know go to different areas, different cameras. There's a tool up in our viewport here, this little rocket ship, which is the speedy viewport mode. And this allows us to uh, basically bypass all of those features and you can see it just turns them off temporarily while this is enabled and we're going to get kind of the performance of our viewport back to just allow us to move around and navigate a little bit easier without having to affect all of these as well as any post-processing on our uh, cameras and our lights that will kind of take a hit to performance. So I'm just going to bump that down and I'm going to uncheck that guy there and you can see we're back to normal. All right so now that we've got our material and all that sorted out I want to go ahead and I want to kind of play around with the lighting get a little bit of a feel for our HDRI backgrounds and just get a basis for what our kind of our I'll say color scheme is going to be for our lighting. So if I come over into our explorer and I click on the sky tab there, you can see that immediately we get this HDRI. And this is the HDRI that's actually illuminating our scene right now. It doesn't quite look like it, but if I come into our backdrop, this is going to allow us to change the actual visualization of our scene here. So right now we've got our ambient sky, which is basically just using a blurred version um, and basically only displaying the um, illumination values or the color values for the light that's actually affecting the scene. It's kind of an average of all of the areas of this image. I change it to blurred sky. You can see that it's just the image that's blurred. The sky here where it's just the actual HDRI image. And then color. And color is just going to be a solid image uh, display and again none of these different modes actually affect the lighting information of our object because it's all using this HDRI it's simply just displaying it visually for us to change kind of the background and the look of the final render. So I normally just go with color and for the sake of this tutorial, I'm just going to go with solid color as well, just to make it easier to visualize what's going on. But just keep in mind that whatever image we decide to use here is really what's going to be illuminating our scene. And so with that said, I want to go ahead and I want to actually change this HDRI because I don't really like the color scheme that it's got going on here. So I'm going to go to presets. And this is going to open up a bunch of different skies for us. And so if you just click on them, it's going to ultimately switch them and display all of these different uh, HDRI lighting values over top of our material here. And so I kind of like this one right here, the castle sunset. So whenever you find one that you like, all you have to do is hit done. And then we've got this image now as our HDRI lighting our scene here. So you can come in here and affect the brightness of the HDRI, make it a little less bright. I normally just kind of keep this around one. And so we also have this 
child light brightness. And if we bring this up and down, it doesn't do anything. And that's because we don't have any child lights in our scene. So the way that we set up these child lights is if we go into our image here and I just left click, you can see immediately we've got this light right in here. We've got this little handle over here and you can see that under our sky tab, we've basically just created a point light or a directional light for our scene. And as I move this around, you can see it's going to affect the different areas of our mesh because it's moving around our HDRI in a 360 degree uh, rotation. And you can see that it's going to ultimately adopt the color value of wherever it is located in our HDRI here. And so that's pretty handy if we kind of want to have some more almost faking global illumination or uh, diffuse reflection. And so before we get too invested in that, I want to find an area of my material that I think is going to be kind of the more interesting uh, point to view. And I think here is going to look really cool for my render. So now that I've established an area that I want to basically view for my static shots, I'm going to come back into our child light. And I'm going to bring this right back down to one because we can actually affect these lights individually. And if I come up to their tab up here, you can see that I can affect the brightness of this guy right here. I can also change the color as well. Say if I wanted something that's a little bit more golden. Maybe bring that brightness down just a, just a smidge. And I might desaturate it just a little bit more. And then we can also come into our width. And you can see if I increase the width of it, its effects are very, very subtle. So you can see if I leave the width all the way down, we've got some nice harsh shadows because our basically our size of our light is very small. And so it's not encompassing the entirety of our material. But as we increase the width, we're also basically just increasing the size. And so there's going to be softer contact with surfaces as well as softer shadows. If I bring this down, and bring it up. And so because this is going to be kind of our key light right here, I want this to be a little bit softer, but not too soft because I, I really like shadows and how they kind of define a material. We can also come into our little gizmos here and we can rotate and change the, uh, basically the influence that this uh, light has over our material. And it's the same way as if we were to move it in here. The only problem is that if I move it in here, it's going to ultimately adopt the colors of whatever the HDRI is. So if you find that you get an area that you like it and you get a color that you like, it's probably uh, better advised to then start manipulating that light with our little gizmos. And so now that I've got kind of that key light or that prominent light kind of in the nice top right corner of my material where I normally like to place them, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add more of an ambient light. And the way that I like to have my uh, ambient light is kind of almost perpendicular to where our key light is to kind of almost balance it out and give it two kind of almost polar opposite but very similar kind of relationship. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back into our HDRI and I'm just going to drag this guy around until I kind of find the area that I think kind of fits it. And so I think right there is not going to be too bad. So if I just bring up the brightness so I can see where it is, I want to play around with these gizmos a little bit. I'm going to bump down the brightness 
now that I've kind of found where it is, I want to kind of leave it so that it, it's, again, kind of polar opposite to up here. But I also want it to be able to reach kind of towards the center, almost like a creation of atom, where they're just about touching um, and almost reaching, reaching for each other. And so I want to affect this color to make it a little bit more of a blue, just a, a kind of softer blue. Again, a little bit of an off-white, just because it's going to be a more ambient color. And I like to have a little bit more aqua color as opposed to navy or deep blue, just because it's kind of fits the atmosphere of this material because it's kind of melting snow, melting ice. And you don't really get those deeper blues. You get those more kind of transparent or subscattered blue lights. And that's also kind of leading into a little bit later when we come back into our diffusion tab here and we play around a little bit with the subscattering. So now that I've got this kind of how I want it, I want to make sure there's a little bit of a defined area in between these lights that is just going to be strictly handled by our HDRI image. We can play around with the width a little bit. Just to kind of get rid of those shadows. You can play around with the brightness as well. Something small like that. That's starting to look pretty cool. All right, and so lastly, I want to come in here to our sky again, and I want to add a little bit of a rim light just so that we can kind of get this nice sharp contrast um, on our material and just make it look really, really kind of chic. Rim lights make everything look really good, and uh, they're really not that hard to do. So again, I'm going to come in here, and immediately I'm going to try and find kind of right in this corner here, and it looks like kind of this pocket over here if I can find it again there we go so if I just pump that right up it's going to help us kind of find the uh, the area of our mesh that I want to work on and I just want to I want to capture just a little bit of the corners not so much down here maybe just a little bit and actually, maybe I want to play around over here. Nope, I want to go back over here. So now that we've kind of got this nice little corner, nice little rim light, should maybe bump that up a little bit more. There we go. We again can play around with the width, bring down the brightness of it, just to get some nice, nice streak, nice shiny area. And that looks pretty cool to me. Again, for your material, might require a little bit more refinement, but overall, this is kind of the process that I use to get our lighting situation all set up by starting with uh, a nice kind of HDRI to give us a nice color palette, a nice uh, theme that I try and really use just kind of for the middle area. I create a fill light up top here to give us that nice presenting light, that nice shine or glimmer where most of the object is going to be um, kind of lit from. I add a nice fill or ambient light down here to give us a nice contrasting color. Again, kind of that creation of atom vibe where both of our uh, key and fill lights are kind of just reaching out towards each other but barely grasping. And then I like to have this nice little uh, rim light just to add a little bit of a, a new, uh, different kind of effect to the overall composition. So now that we're happy with the, uh, the kind of the lighting situation that we've set up here, I want to go ahead and start focusing more on our camera. 
and setting that up and making sure that we kind of have it situated where we want to actually take the still renders um, and the animated renders of our material. So you can see up here that we've got our main camera. And the way that the cameras actually work is that the viewport is basically enacting or taking place as the camera. So I don't want to move the camera really because I like the situation that I've created right now where I've got um, all of the lighting coming in from the different angles. And if I was to move the camera, that lighting would have to be uh, basically readjusted or we would have to try and figure out how to readjust the camera. So I'm going to come into our Explorer here and hit Control D to duplicate our camera. And I'm going to name this one Render. So we know that this is our render camera and this is kind of our moving camera. So you can see up in our viewport here that we've got moving and we've got render. And if I select that, I'm actually switching between the two cameras right now. But because they're in the same spot, we're not going to see really any difference whatsoever. So if I rotate around and move this guy out, you can see why we don't really want to move the camera because one of the consequences of our rim light here is that we need to blow out the back end of this so that we get that nice little sliver of rim light. But if I come back up to here and hit render, you can see that we're just viewing this camera and not the other camera that is zooming around. And you can see that over there, that's our render camera right there. So I try and keep at least one camera for moving and then however many cameras I want to set up for different uh, angles and different shots. So if I go back to our render camera here and I click on render so that we're going to be affecting our render camera, we get a whole list of properties. So the first one that I go to is under lens, I go to the field of view. And so with the field of view, you've probably seen it in video games and everything, heard it FOV. This is basically going to kind of change the perspective of our objects in our 3D view here. And you can see if I pump this all the way up to you know 150 and I zoom in with this camera, it's going to make our object look really kind of distorted and stretched. And inversely, if I bring this all the way down to like one or two, and I zoom that guy way out, you can see that it's going to kind of flatten our material a little bit. And so I normally try and keep this at around 15 because I want it to be flattened out a little bit just so we can see kind of various areas of our material and we can see as you know a lot of our material as it kind of flattens out but it still allows a little bit of curvature to it so that we can also see the roundedness and how our material kind of goes around our uh, mesh and how it kind of just gels together so I leave our field of view at around 15. I also come down to save frame just so that it better illustrates what we're going to actually be rendering. So anything that you can um, see inside of this rectangle here will be rendered. And these black bars on the outside are going to be what is not rendered. So we consider uh, this rectangle here as our camera, what is visible. And so that's just going to help us from accidentally zooming in a little too far and then going, oh shoot, but I really wanted this information up here. So we can see quite uh, easily that it's not going to be rendered. So now that we've got those out of the way, we can come down to our post facts. And this is where a lot of the more interesting and more polished items take place. So we can change the exposure of our, basically our entire scene here. So I like to leave that on one. Can bring our contrast up just a little bit and I do something like around actually I like it at kind of point uh, 025 just adds a little bit more contrast lets it stand out from the background a little bit better and we can also play around with the saturation just to add a little bit more color into the the entirety of our scene here 
Maybe that's a little too much. So maybe I'm going to do 1.3. Again, you can see a lot more color that's uh, happening in here. You can see almost kind of the different tiers that we're going to get from our different lighting scenes. And then we can also come up and change the curves for our uh, tone mapping. And so one thing I like to do is just give it a simple S curve where we make the darks a little darker, make the whites a little whiter, making sure that we don't really want to blow out this area too much. Something simple just like that. And then I just hit OK. So now we've got these effects down here as well. And these are very cool because they pretty much change kind of the readability um, and almost, again, kind of that high qualityness that you see on a lot of renders. And it's actually not that hard to do, but it makes it look so much better. So I'm going to go into our Sharpen here. And the way that Sharpen works, if I pump this guy all the way up, you can see that it's going to take all of our uh, kind of our edge information and all of the details and it's going to extract them and then just kind of really pronounce them a little bit more. So the way that I work is I kind of, I start at zero and I kind of drag it up until I really start to notice like, okay, this is visibly too sharp and it's no longer clear. And so I drag that up until I get to about the threshold where I go, okay, this is starting to get sharp, kind of like here. And I dial it back just a little bit. And so I think maybe 2.25 in this certain instance might look okay. And it's going to change uh, from eye to eye, person to person, and material to material. So what might look good to me might not look good to you. And what might look good on my material might not look good on yours. So it's all circumstantial, but that's kind of the way that I do it, where I build it up from zero upwards to about the point where I go, yeah, this doesn't look too good. And then I dial it back, you know, a small percentage. And actually looking at it now, even 2.25 might be a little too much. I might want to dial this back down. 1.25 looks a little bit better. It just helps add a little bit of clarity to our edges. It makes things not as muddled. Next, we get Bloom, and you can see if we crank this guy right up, it's going to make our entire thing pretty shiny, which, you know, kind of looks cool if it, we were going for more of a, uh, I don't know, gas giant, not so much a ball of snow. And Bloom is a great way to add just a little bit more uh, lighting features to your material and also a very easy way to make your render look like a flaming hot pile of trash. So this is one that you, I really think, need to use very sparingly, very conservatively. Because for a lot of things, blur or bloom, I should say, doesn't quite <laughs> emphasize it in the way that you want it to. So I'm going to bring the brightness right down. I just want to have a little bit of glow, especially in our rim light area. I also want to just bring the size of that down just a little bit. So you can see we get this little bit of uh, bloom just kind of around the edges. And so it helps accentuate the final product, but it doesn't blow it right out and be the main focus. You never want bloom to be your main focus. And if it is, you're doing it wrong because bloom is great, but bloom is a very easy uh, transformative tool to make you become the next Michael Bay. If you don't get that joke, don't worry about it. It's not that funny. So the next one that I go to is I go down to vignette and vignette's pretty standard where again, if we crank this guy up, you can see that we're getting kind of the dark edges to really hone in the focus towards the center of our image. Now we don't actually have anything else in this image other than the material. So it's not as important to draw the focus into it, but I really like to do it just because I think it adds a nice um, kind of cohesion over top of everything. And so with this gradient or this vignette, it's a little bit too, uh, well, black and not black. So I'm going to really crank up the softness of it. And then you can see as I dial back the effect of it, I kind of just want to have a little bit of the corners. 
just kind of kissing. And actually that might be a little bit too much even there. I'm going to maybe change the softness up to two. Just so that we have a little bit of a longer gradient. And something like that where the edges are a little bit darker, but nothing is uh, quite opaque. It's more of a nice linear gradient. So that's pretty much the gist of the post effects. Again, you can go in and play around with a whole bunch of things. As well, up here, we've got our focus tab under the lens, and this allows us to play with the depth of field. And so you can see here that we can also play around with our near and far blur. Just add a little bit more of a uh, visual effect on everything. However, I normally don't use depth of field for my materials just because I find it kind of eliminates, you know, our nice bloom and our rim as well as our sharpness on various areas. And because we don't have much of a scene per se, but more so just one material, it doesn't really, I feel, uh, gel with the context of the scene all too nicely. So I normally keep the depth of field off, but it is there in case you feel that it works. So now that we are comfortable with how we're going to present our material with the lighting, with the post effects and the camera and all that, I want to go back into our kind of the, where we started with our material here. And I want to go back down to our diffusion. And so right now by standard, it's set on Lambertian and that's fine. It looks okay. But with snow, there's a little bit of subsurface scattering that's actually going on because of how fine the actual snow particles are. We have the ability to kind of have light almost, uh, well, not almost actually enter our object and kind of scatter around and then shoot back out. And we, so we're going to get a little bit of light bleed actually through our banks of snow. And so if we click on subsurface scatter, we get all of these uh, different um, parameters here or properties. And so immediately what I'm drawn to is again our scatter map. And so this is going to basically be a mask for the areas that we're going to mask off as not transparent or sorry, um, subsurface scatterable and areas that are subsurface scatterable. And so I'm going to click on this guy here and I have this subsurface uh, snow map here and you can see that the areas that I don't want light to penetrate are going to be the rocks and anywhere that I'm okay with the light penetrating is going to be white and it's going to be the snow. So immediately I'm going to plug that in and you can see that we're going to get, if I go to my moving here and we start taking a look, you can see that we're going to start getting it um, kind of masked off in these visible areas where the rocks and the snow connect. And as we play around with the depth, you can say that, uh, see that the snow is going to kind of become a little bit softer because now it's more susceptible to uh, light bleeding. So I'm going to go back into our render. And so that diffusion is a little bit too deep. I don't want it to be that deep. I still want to get some of my um, actual snow uh, information there. Again, making sure that our sharpness is not too sharp, but again, making everything clear. And so I'm just going to play around a little bit to find kind of a nice area. And if I go back to my moving camera, I want to make sure that the nice uh, the snow is nice and soft, but not too incredibly uh, soft that we don't get those nice kind of noise features. That's looking pretty cool. I'm going to come back to render here. And now I want to go ahead and I want to change some of our render settings because there's a bit of hidden features in our render tab that's going to allow us to just kind of push our material a little bit further. And so I'm going to come up to this green gear here and render. 
and I'm going to come down into our properties here and I want to go down to global illumination and right now you can see that we don't actually have our global illumination set and the way that global illumination works is basically in the indirect lighting from our material so light that hits a surface and bounces off and bounces to various other surface areas is basically what we consider indirect lighting and so because we have light coming into here and then bouncing off of these and then around they actually have color influence over each other and how light kind of spills over on a surface just like if you are in a somewhat dark room and there's a light pouring in and you put your hand in front of it, all of a sudden that light starts bouncing around the room and actually somewhat illuminating various areas of the room with your hand color. One of the biggest things about the global illumination though is that it's very, very uh, resource intensive. And so that's why by default it's checked off. And this is maybe one of the reasons why if you wanted to keep it on, you would just use your speedy viewport. And you can see the difference that has between making our object just look kind of good and pretty awesome. So if I come down here and hopefully my computer doesn't blow up as I'm recording this and we just toggle our enable GI, you can see that now the actual mesh is starting to um, illuminate itself in various areas based off of indirect lighting. And we can pl play around with this brightness as well make it brighter and darker. And now I don't want it to be as bright per se as one. So I bring that up to maybe 0.5. And you can see that we're still slightly getting a little bit of orange from our HDRI, but it's not really present anymore. We're using mostly our rim, fill, and uh, key or point light. And I'm noticing now that maybe with our global illumination, it's a little bit too bright in this area, a little bit too peaky. So all we can do is come down here, maybe bump this up to something like 3.8. And even just change the width a little bit so that it's just not as bright. And so now I'm just going to go up and click our speedy viewport. So just to make the, the next area a little bit quicker to go. And so now I want to just set up a turntable so that we're going to have our mesh kind of spinning around and doing a 360 so that we can set it up to uh, basically render out an animation and so it's actually very very easy to do and so because I want my uh, mesh to spin I'm going to select our sphere and I'm going to come up here and I'm going to hit new turntable and you can see that it's going to basically put this sphere into this turntable and if I drag this guy around you can see that our lighting information is going to stay consistent and it's going to be our object that rotates around. While selecting this turntable as well, you can also change the spin rate so uh, at which uh, pace the actual rotation will occur uh, based on your timeline down here. You can also change the amount of frames and the length and all that. And then if we come up to our capture and go down to settings. You can see that we have our settings for our image. And so with all of my images I render out, I want them to be 1920 by 1080 at a sampling of 16 times and PNG format. And again, there's a bunch of different formats you can choose. I just prefer PNG. And the same goes for the video. 1920 by 1080, 16 times. You can also change the video formats uh, here to sequences, uncompressed. Because I normally up mine straight, uh, upload mine straight to YouTube, I just leave them in video H.264. And if it corrupts, I cry, but that's okay. And then I dial back the quality a little bit just because 
a lot of times these are very long render times because of all of the the posts and all of the effects that we're putting on as well as the lighting calculations so they can get pretty arduous and so i hit okay and finally if i go up to edit and preferences you can see on our output i've just selected a folder that i want all of these to go into and that will be my art station folder and so now anything that we output or render out will go into that folder for us. So now that we've set up our outputs there, I'm going to go ahead and just uncheck this guy here. And I'm going to go up to capture and I'm going to just click image and open. And it's going to take a quick second to render out. And then it's going to open up this image for us. So now that's going to be saved in the area that I have selected for my um, final output. And then we can also go up here to capture and we can select video. Again, it's going to verify that these are the settings that we want. So we're going to have three render 300 frames over 10 seconds. And that's how long our final video format is going to be. And so I'm going to render this out and jump cut for you guys so you don't have to wait. And I'll see you on the other side. Okay, and so now after that's rendered out, we've got our fully realized turntable of our model or our material here. And naturally, you'll want to spend a little bit more time than I did kind of finally adjusting all of these with the lighting and the post effects. But for the most part, we've got the bare bones understanding of how we can take our maps from Substance Designer and bring them in and actually utilize them to create a nice realistic render in Marmoset Toolbag.